the next guy is, um, may I call it, another member of the NSCOM school. And for those of you who are tomorrow morning here, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, some of the conferences. I met Alex at the very first tennis conference in 2009. That's a picture back then. Um, now it's the same Alex with Harris. You want to see? Uh, back in the day, he had another very cup. And uh, yeah, we have to touch over the years, and I, I think I think you made this pretty much every single tennis conference as well, right? Yeah. Because I did. Yeah. So you know, four of them. And uh, I found this T-shirt while uh, looking for a. Uh, um, for Alex and uh, yeah, so uh, it's from Red Gable and it says um, I still recommend Windows for everyday computing. I got to recommend it to Red OS 10 for the fucking extraordinary computing. I will give you the way that Red Gable comes to it. So, so welcome everybody. Uh, Alex Repti, we're talking about right automation. That's not the way you walk. I've Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, although I have to say you suck at Scottish accents. It's not what Matt Gemmel sounds like at all. But that aside, uh, hi, I'm Alex Repti. I'm here to talk to you today about effectively using UI automation. Um, judging by the usual chatter on Twitter. I assume not too many people out there actually use UI automation beyond just testing it for a little bit. So uh, I hope to give you a good introduction to show you ways in which you can use it. And uh, yeah, I hope you learned something. Well, first of all, why would you want to automate? There's three reasons. The first of all is laziness. The second is impatience. And the third one is hubris. And uh, according to a very wise man like Larry Wall, those are the three great virtues of a programmer. And I know that this is true, because if I weren't so damn lazy, as Mike pointed out earlier today, I know I wouldn't be a programmer. If I wasn't lazy, I would do repetitive tasks, and I wouldn't invent ways to avoid doing repetitive tasks. So this is what drives me to do automated testing on my software. Because I don't want to sit there and do the same test over and over again if some program can do it way better than I ever could. But what are automated tests, actually? Automated tests, in this case UI automation, drive the user interface without any human interference. Basically, the point is you just start a script it drives the UI of your application and does things that normally a human would do, testing your application and looking for failures. I think of it just a little like unit tests for the GUI. And as those tests run, they log progress, basically passes and fails in your application and inform you if something breaks. You find out quickly when something does break and uh, can do countermeasures instantly without shipping the software with the fault inside. But that's not all that UI automation does. UI automation can also be used to automate annoying tasks, which is where the laziness comes in again. You don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Or you could use it to demo your products. Think of a trade show. You're, so, you're showing something, your product, on an iPad, for example. If you do it yourself, you obstruct the view of your product. And you have to focus on using your product and talking to your potential customer at the same time. If you run an automation script and the software shows itself, you can engage your customer much better. And you can use it to quickly perform tasks multiple times. Just write a for loop and do something a hundred times, a thousand times. It doesn't matter. You can also use it for screenshots and screencasts. You can automate screenshots at various points during uh, the running of your application. 
And you can use it for screencasts. You can record the screencast of a predefined script so there's no possible mistakes in doing a wrong click or losing your train of thought. Now, I'm talking specifically about UI automation here and not about any other frameworks that would allow you to record tests or write tests and run them on your simulator or device. That is because UI automation is instantly available for everyone. If you have Xcode and instruments on your Mac, you have UI automation. Well, if you have the iPhone S iOS SDK, then you have UI automation. Um, so all of you can start using it right away, and there is no arcane setup, uh, like no 1,000 word manual to install it and get it to run. It's very easy to set up and use. I'm going to show you this in a minute. Compared to other frameworks, it's a blast to just get started with it. And it improves your application accessibility. And uh, you all hopefully know that accessibility is a very important topic. And Apple is on the forefront of making their products accessible for people who, for example, are visually impaired or even blind. And so should you. And it's very, very easy, and I'm going to show you this in a minute. First of all, I'm going to show you an example of what it's like to use UI automation. I'm going to use my application Foodish here. Um, it's been on the App Store for a while. It's totally not accessible. I know, I'm at fault. Um, and, well, it's, it's, I think it's a well-designed product, and usually people back me up on this, so I can do this claim here. And, but it's not very accessible, and uh, I have no automated testing on it. So I've, I've never actually used UI automation on Foodish. So I just take whatever was the last tag in my repository uh, and run this and use UI automation with it and see how well it works. And and this is what it looks like. I recorded this last week. I just click product, profile, instruments launches. I pick the automation instrument and the app launches. Now I can record something by creating a new script. Don't worry if you can't read all the text. I'm going to highlight important parts later. Give it a title. Doesn't matter if I have a typo or not. And just click the record button. Now, using, using the iOS simulator, I use the app. And you can see that some parts in the middle, there's code being filled in there as I use the application and as I uh, interact with it. It records everything I do. And in this case, Foodish is a little food diary. So, it's just very basic. I add an item to it, which I want to keep in my food diary, give it a title, a health rating, which is those little smileys there, and in this case, I just delete it again, and that's my script. Now, I just play this back, and you will notice this is very, very fast. It's not the same timing that I use. It just does actions about as quickly as it can do them. Gives the health rating, goes back to the main screen, back to the item, and deletes it. This is insanely fast, so let me just show this again. Opens the app. It runs the script that I wrote. You can see the progress in the log in the middle as it executes the script. And does it the same way every time. Now, if I were to change something about how this process is done, if I introduce a bug somewhere in the, progress, in the process, then the script would halt. Okay, let's take a look at the code that was being generated by me clicking in the iPhone simulator and uh, driving the UI. This is the piece of code that was generated. Um, if you've never seen this before, well, it's JavaScript, first of all. Uh, if you've never seen this before, it's very unreadable, I suppose. Um, and there's many parts there that are especially unreadable or hard to figure out. 
And I want to show you, I want to highlight two specific parts here. First of all, the upper one accesses um, all of the text fields, an array of all of the text fields inside our current view and accesses the first object inside this text field array. Now, if you read the code that was generated here, you have no idea which text field that is without any further context. Also, it is very likely to break in the future as you, for example, add more text fields to the view and move them around. So, if you use this code as it is, you're going to have a hard time in the future. It's going to break at some point. The other one is the tab on the main screen. When I go back to the main screen after creating the item and tap on this newly created item to open it up again, that is what this tap offset x 0.36 y 0.33 is. And this is even harder to figure out because you have no idea where on the screen this is without imagining the screen and then maybe holding up a ruler, a ruler to your screen or something. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to continue to use something like this. So, I will, uh, to sum this up, the generated code is hard to read. You have no context, you have no idea what's going on. That makes it even harder to edit. Um, usually, a process goes like you record a script like this and then edit it by hand and uh, copy and paste it and produce other script, scripts which are similar. Um, that's not easily possible with this code. And that makes it impossible to maintain on a large scale. Because what you want to do when you test your application is you want to test basically every single piece of functionality that you have. And uh, for most iPhone applications, uh, a test suite like that can be very, very big. You can have 40, 50 different tests or even more. Now, if you want to maintain those, and you will have to because your UI will change at some point, then using this code, you basically have to record it all over again. Um, but if you make it readable and maintainable, then it's very easy. It might not break at all. You might not have to change anything. And you can, yeah, just continue using it or make just minor adjustments. And the solution to do that is you use the accessibility APIs that Apple gives you. Now, how do you go about implementing accessibility in your app? How do you make your app accessible? It's rather easy. This is specific for any kind of uh, UI control or UI view. You just enable accessibility for this item. You assign it an accessibility label. And optionally, you can give it an accessibility hint and accessibility traits. Um, and I encourage you to try this with your own apps. If you have iPhone or iPad apps, do this with your own apps. Enable voiceover when you do so and uh, check out what it's like to use your accessible app with voiceover. Now, how do you go about actually doing this? There's two ways to do it. The first one is an interface builder. You just Take your element. In this case, I'm using the UI text field where the user enters the title of the meal or snack that they just had. Um, in the inspector, I click the checkbox for accessibility to make sure accessibility is enabled on my object. I give it a label, in this case, item title. And optionally, I can give it a hint uh, and give it traits such as user interaction enabled. So that the user knows they can interact with this item. Now, let's take a look again at the generated code. This was the generated code for or to access the text field in our screen and to tap on it to highlight it and bring the keyboard up. Again, zero-based uh, arrays, um, not very good to read and might break in the future. But if you access it, if you make it accessible and access it using the accessibility label that you just assigned, your code looks like this. Granted, it's just a little longer, but it's very easy to read. 
you can just read through the JavaScript code and you know exactly which text field is currently being used, which text field is being focused. And it's not very prone to break in the future. It might just last that much longer. Um, for other items, such as the items on the main screen, we have code like this, tap with offset. And this is some sort of offset that you have to either calculate in your head or you have to get the calculator out to find out exactly where that tap is taking place. Um, that is not so good. So we're going to change this. So we get this code. We access the array of buttons in our current view and get the one that is labeled fruit and tap that. Now, how can we do that? This is in code, for example, because this item is not an interface builder. I draw it, uh, I draw it completely in code. Uh, just three lines of code. First of all, this is the same as a checkbox in Interface Builder. You make sure the item is an accessibility element. You assign it an accessibility label. In this case, just something out of your data structure, the item that is being represented, for example. And optionally, traits. So in this case, I declare that it behaves like a button, which is why I can access it, access it in the buttons array. Um, yeah, and visually impaired users know uh, by this that they can tap on the item, that they can interact with it. Now, all of this leads to slightly better code. There's still a lot of problems with this, but the two elements that I showed you and that I just uh, worked around are a lot clearer. The code is a lot easier to read. Uh, you know what is going on, on what kind of items uh, this script is working, and uh, it's also way easier to maintain in the future. Unfortunately, there are items for which this will not easily work, but those are the exception to the rule. Um, for example, I won't get around this. Because this is um, the segmented control, the little smiley faces you saw. The segmented control with custom UI image views in which the smiley faces are contained. And uh, there's no way to work around this currently. Because UI segmented control accessibility sucks. Really, it does. Um, it's okay if you have a text-based UI segmented control, but if you have an image-based segmented control, you have to live with this right now. Hopefully, Apple will improve this in the future. But as I said, this is the exception to the rule, and in no way does this apply to all items, or to even to many items. Okay, so what do you do to improve accessibility? You check your view hierarchy. There is a function called lock element tree in the UI automation JavaScript framework. You can use that to see um, a complete description of your, your view hierarchy in the log. Basically, if you know recursive description, it's practically the same. And it will show you which items are accessible and which are not, and what the accessibility labels are in those items. You can find the ones that are not accessible or that don't behave like you want them to and uh, make them accessible. So hopefully, you can write tests that last. Um, as I said, you don't want to go around changing your tests all the time. If you spend more time changing your tests than actually testing your software, you're not going to continue doing that. You, it's, it's no fun. You don't want to do that because it's a mundane task and you as a programmer have better things to do. Okay, improve accessibility. If you find something that doesn't work exactly like it should, there's ways to check out how it behaves without making your iPhone go black and using voiceover and simulating a visually impaired person. In the iPhone simulator, there's a tool called the Accessibility Inspector. And that is very cool. 
So just go to settings, enable the accessibility inspector, and you get this nice little pop-up window there. And whenever you focus an element now, it will show you the accessibility information for that item. For example, in this case, you see, I got my accessibility label, item title, and uh, I know that this worked, and I can, can continue clicking through my application to find out what the weak links are and why they don't behave as I want to. Okay, I can't possibly teach you everything about accessibility in the context of this talk, but I encourage you to check out this article by Matt Gamble. I will put up the slides on SlideShare or something later, so you don't have to write down the URLs right now. Um, this article is excellent. Matt has put a lot of thought into accessibility, into how it works, into how improved applications and their accessibility for the users. In fact, it's so good, even Apple links to it. And, well, good accessibility, as I just showed you, is very, very important for proper automation. And essentially, you get two birds with one stone. You improve your application for, for disabled users, and you make sure you have less bugs in your application. If you run proper test suites, you will find bugs sooner, and uh, hopefully eliminate them sooner, and deliver a better product. And this is again where I pick up where Mike, what Mike mentioned earlier. You want to deliver great products. Absolutely. And if your product is great, if all of it works well together, you have just such a better chance of Apple noticing your application, of featuring your application somewhere in the App Store, and that's where you want, that's what you want to get. You want your application featured. And if you use the best technologies that Apple offers, they're much more likely to pick you up. Okay, so much for the theory behind testing and how to make it work, but how do you go about actually testing your UI? There's a class called UIA Logger, which has, I think, these four functions, or at least these are the, uh, the most important functions. You can just log a message. You can log the start of a part of the execution of your script. You can log passes and log fails, and they will show up as such in the log of, in instruments. <coughs> Unfortunately, there's no built-in support for assertions in UI automation, but there is a very lightweight third-party library called TuneUpJS that solves that. I'll give you the link later. Um, that gives you assertions and various other tools to work with UI automation. And uh, you can even make UI automation work with continuous integration systems. Instruments now has a CLI command, so you don't need the instruments UI. And you can just run it from, from the command line interface or from shell scripts or Jenkins or Hudson or whatever you use to provide continuous integration. An example of what this might look like if you use UIA logger to actually provide pass and fail messages in your log is this. This is my spaghetti code again. Um, and at this point, I check if the item is actually valid. So after creating it and going back to the main screen, I want to make sure that the item is there to make sure that my data model works, that it saved the item with the correct title and everything. So I use this code to make sure that it's there. If it is there, I'll log pass that the item exists. I'll go ahead, tap on it, and delete it again. If it's not, I can log a fail, and I will notice later in my run log. Hopefully, if all goes well, you see this message. Spaghetti item exists, pass. If it doesn't, you'll notice. Now, uh, you're probably not just going to run one test to just one piece of functionality in your app. You want to run multiple tests. They can be in the same JavaScript file. You can import other JavaScript files. Um, however, you can chain those tests 
uh, and run them one after another. And I'm going to give you a small demo what it looks like to run three separate tests right next to each other. The first one of those is going to be the spaghetti test that you already saw. I'm going to add the item, go back to the main screen, and delete it again. <clears throat> In the second test, I'm going to go to yesterday, add an item labeled steak there, and delete it again. And in the third test, I'm going to add an item, tweet it, and then delete the item again. And this is what it's going to look like. You've all seen this part. There's nothing new right now. Okay, first test succeeded. See how UI automation scroll scroll view there? It, it does that, but it still works. Here's again. I'm sure it can be made to, to look actually better, but I haven't played around with it very much. Okay, so now is something you haven't seen. I'm gonna add an item. Damn you, autocorrect and tweet about it. It sends a tweet, deletes the item, and it's done. This is practically what a test suit would look like. Now, these are the, the results. We get a pass for the spaghetti item. We can even take screenshots of our tests to verify that our UI looked the way we wanted it to look. For example, if you have a large number of tests running, you may want to run them overnight, or on a different machine if you use CI, and uh, you can just check up later to see what the results were of your tests. And if you have screenshots, if something fails, that's an invaluable resource. Ken mentioned this earlier, you want to log stuff. You need to gather data about the failures and bugs in your programs. And this is an excellent way to do it. <coughs> now, there's several more things you can do with UI automation. Um, for example, you can handle both unexpected and expected alerts. You all know this, a UI alert view pops up. It might be from your program, you might which want to be testing your error handling. It might be from the operating system because some sort of alert is going on. Um, you can provide a handler function to handle those alerts and uh, use them accordingly. You can test multitasking. Um, you can, for example, deactivate the app for any given duration and see if your background code works correctly. It just enables the app again, brings it back to the foreground, and you get to see if everything is still working and if your background handling code works. Orientation changes. Uh, since you can also check the frames of object and do screenshots, you can easily test to see if the items are all where they should be when the orientation of your device changes. You can set the location. So if you have an application that uses location data, uh, you can set the location inside your test and thus you have a way of, of automating running around somewhere and getting new location data constantly. And you can do gestures, so as, a, as a pinch gesture or swipe. You can do all those. Now, several other things that you can use your automation for, not in the context of testing your application stability, are, for example, you can take screenshots, as I just showed you. You can use those to automate screenshots for the App Store. That's really good, because if your UI changes just a little bit, you might have to go around doing all five screenshots again. Or, if your app is localized, you might need to go around and take 50 new screenshots, and you don't want that. You can write a script that does it. You can use localized um, scripts, because the, item, the accessibility item label will change, of course. 
you can use localized scripts and do that. And I hope your applications are localized. If not, there's two people who are coming up after me who want to talk to you about that. And you can do easily reproducible screencasts with perfect timing. You can just build in small delays where you need them for narration. Uh, you can do, you can drive your whole application as fast or as slow as you want. And you can document your test runs, gather data. If something fails, you want to know why it failed and you want to know how it failed. Okay, another interesting thing you can do with UI automation and that I actually did with my application is this. Everybody get what that is? Basically, it just taps on random locations all over your application. Uh, in this case, a thousand times. You could do it like a million times and leave it running overnight. And you're going to find out interesting things about your app that you didn't know before. I guarantee it. I found out that this happens. The target application appears to have died. Yes, it did. Um, first of all, I was not very happy about this, but then I realized I just found a bug. Within a few minutes of testing your automation and just running this bugshot testing script, I found an actual bug in my app, and I, I, now I can go and fix it. Or, well, okay, I was too excited and clicked the error message away, and now I can't fix it. Okay. These are all the things that work pretty well with UI automation and that will really help you make your apps better. Um, but there's, of course, a few things that are not so good about UI automation that I think you should know, too. For example, there's no way to set up or reset state. So if a test fails, you may have to exit the script and uh, delete stuff you just added manually or delete the preferences files or what have you. Delete the whole application of the simulator. Um, you can, of course, work around this if you have a continuous integration environment because you can just put every test into a single JavaScript file and if it did not work correctly, just reset application state. It only runs via instruments. There's no standalone binaries that will run, so you have to use the instrument's UI or the CLI command. If you do use the CLI command to integrate this into a CI workflow, you might need some arcane shell scripts to do that. Fortunately, there are very clever people in this world who have already figured out how to do this. So I'm going to give you the link for a tutorial on how to do this with Jasmine and Jenkins in a bit. And um, this might be very important for some of you. There is no built-in method for mock objects. So if you definitely need mock objects, like in unit testing, you might have to do a special build, special build conditions or something. All in all, UI automation is still very young and still maturing. I think it came out two years ago, in 2010, with iOS 4. They, add, they added recording capabilities in iOS 5, and, uh, well, it's still growing. Um, hopefully, Apple sticks to it, puts a lot of effort into it, because I think it's a great way to test your applications, to find bugs, and to improve your applications. Um, there's, of course, other frameworks that I didn't look into nearly as much um, because they have certain drawbacks. Uh, but I'll show you what is good, what's bad, and what's ugly about those. For example, there's Squish. Squish is uh, an application by a company from Hamburg called Frog Logic. Um, what's good about Squish is that it provides multiple languages to write your tests in. You can basically use Ruby, PHP, Perl, JavaScript, basically every scripting language you can think of. And it runs on multiple platforms. So if you have Mac applications and iPhone applications, Squish might be something for you. But it's a commercial application. And I think the cheapest one developer license that I found was about 2,500 euros or so. And the ugly? You need Eclipse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's 
Kiff. Keep it functional from Square. You know the the guys who do credit card payments on iPhones in the US. Unfortunately, not here. Um, Kiff. The good thing about Kiff is you write your tests in Objective C as opposed to JavaScript. So. You don't need to dive into JavaScript. You don't need to sit around all day. Oh God, I hate JavaScript. You can just write it in Objective-C, much like your favorite unit test framework. <coughs> and uh, yeah, don't need to switch to instruments, for example, to edit your text or to a different IDE to edit JavaScript. You can just do it all in Xcode. Now, the bad thing about KIF is that it uses private API to accomplish its task. You might say that's not so bad. I don't want to submit my tests to the App Store, just the actual app. But private API is always a problem because Apple might go and change relevant parts of that API in the next version of iOS. So you might be left sitting there without a working test when iOS 6 comes out or iOS 7 and your tests just don't work and you have no way to quickly make them work. And the ugly part about this is the setup. Um, I think if someone asked me what I hated most about Xcode, I would say it's getting some certain frameworks to work, such as 320 or something. You have to edit header, uh, header location paths, uh, import the framework. There's way too many steps involved. It always breaks at some point. And this is what this setup for Keep It Functional looks like. Um, I think the readme is like a thousand words and 20 screenshots. So UI automation, two clicks, and this is an hour wasted. And there's Calabash. Well, there's actually more, but I think those are the three most important ones. Uh, Calabash has a very interesting approach to automation in that it, uh, it uses natural language. So um, I don't know the exact specific, but it's like, when I tap this, I see this. And if it doesn't see that, then your test failed. Um, yeah, but the setup for Calabash is bad. It's not as bad as, as Keep It Functional, so this is why this is in the bad column and not in the ugly column. Um, the ugly part is that it uses a client-server architecture, so you need to integrate uh, the server into your iOS code to run it on the device. It's all very annoying. Those might offer all of those might offer more features than UI automation, but they're just not as easy to use, and you can't get running as quickly. Okay, so all in all, I think I'm a bit short here. Um, I think automated testing is awesome. It frees me from from repeat uh, from repetitive tasks because. This is where laziness, impatience, and hubris comes in again. I'm too lazy to check all of my application's features again whenever I commit something to my repository. I'm too impatient to wait for the results for that because I have to click around and I take shortcuts. I know, oh, I didn't change anything related to that view controller, I don't have to change it. That's always the one that's gonna break. And uh, yeah, that's hubris for you, basically. Um, UI automation is pretty good, as it is, but it's even better with accessibility support. And you get two birds with one stone. You test your app, you make sure it has less bugs, uh, you ship a better product, it's, it crashes less, it uh, always handles data correctly, hopefully, and it has accessibility. You just made your app that much better with very little work. Basically, you build cases to test your application's features. In the ideal case, you want, you want one test case, at least one test case, per feature of your app. So in my case, I would write one to test adding an item and deleting it again, and verifying that it's actually deleted. And I would test one, uh, I would write one test to check uh, the, the tweet functionality, and one for the Facebook functionality. And when I add new features, I need to write new tests for that. In the ideal world, you basically start writing tests as soon as you start writing code. And 
you can use all this to automate repetitive tasks. Taking screenshot, demming your product, that should all feed right into the laziness and impatience part again. So in general, you spend less time testing and more time doing important stuff, really important stuff. This has compiling, but my code's testing is just as good. Uh, for further reading, you don't need to write this down right now. I will upload the slides later. There's basically two guys you should look into if you're getting serious about UI automation. That's Jonathan Penn at CocoManifest.net. He's also Jonathan Penn on Twitter and GitHub. And Alex Vollmer at alexvollmer.com and Alex Vollmer on Twitter and GitHub. Those two write regularly uh, about UI automation. They have nice tutorials up on their websites and uh, share code and uh, slides from their talks about UI automation. And Alex Warner's GitHub repository is where you can find TuneUp.js, the library you need to use assertions in your code. There's also a very good article by Sean Irvine um, about using automated or doing automated acceptance tests with UI automation, Jasmine, and Jenkins. So if you get really serious about testing, you will have a continuous integration environment. Every time you push something to your repository, it will build it, check for build errors, it will run your tests on it, and you get a report on a website. And there is Philip Hausleiter, uh, and he has a nice article on using UI automation for multi-language iOS applications. So if your app is localized, which hopefully it is, uh, you can use tests to, uh, in multiple localizations to check if your accessibility item labels are correct. You can use it to automate screenshots for the App Store, as I mentioned earlier. And of course, there's Apple. There's the UI automation reference library. This is pretty good if you already got into a UI automation a bit, but it just doesn't really provide a starting point. It's really just a reference library. But they have WWC session videos. There was definitely one in 2010, uh, I think session 306, um, but there might have also been some in 2011 and this year's WWDC. So download the video and check that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. After a smoke. After a smoke. After a smoke. No, we don't smoke here. I smoke outside. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's like 15 minutes. <laughs>